各位来宾您好，欢迎莅临泛南岛原名信宇当代艺术国际论坛暨策展工作坊。海洋是隔绝陆地的障碍，还是连接土地的方法呢？当南岛语族搭乘弦外支架独木舟，航向更广大的世界时，流动与迁徙便成为南岛文化的特质之一。因应高美馆自二零零六年以来展开的南岛当代艺术计划。本次泛南岛原民性与当代艺术国际论坛暨策展工作方，也将思考如何透过南方与岛屿研究的角度，扩大南岛议题的讨论，并扩展其中更宽阔的可能性。活动一开始，让我们邀请高雄市立美术馆李玉玲馆长来为我们揭开今天的序幕。有请李玉玲馆长。这样可以吗？好，呃，各位参加呃今天论坛的贵宾哈，好朋友，大家早安哈。真的早上有点点吓着我们是楼上正在展出的太阳雨哈，山笑了。<笑>那首先我要再次的感谢啊，远道而来的我们今天的国际的贵宾讲者哈，还有与会的国内的学者专家们哈，好，大家早安。那我想哈，今天高美馆在这里举办这个饭，我要慢慢的讲哈，饭。南岛其实分开的三个字哈，这样的一个国际论坛，其实要谈的事情相当的多哈。那透过今天，还有明天有一个工作坊，跟呃第三天是一个内部的一个呃我们策展的一个工作坊哈，其实是在为二零二零年，也就是明年我们即将举办的一个大型的国际型的一个以暂定的名称，至少方向上是。泛南岛这样子的一个暂定的名，一个 working title 哈，一个暂定的名称，做的一个国际的艺术季做准备哈。我想，诚如今天在来来的呃一些我们艺术界的好朋友们哈，我想大家都知道，高美馆在一九九四年成立的时候，当时当初的使命可以说是称为台湾呃南部哈，所谓的台湾南部第一大馆这样子的一个角色。那从开馆以来，也一直都致力于生根这个所谓的对在地艺术文化的生根哈，这样子的一个地域型的，特别是强调大大高雄，也就是高高平，然后在台南美术馆还没成立之前，我想我们也南扩到包括整个南高呃南台湾的这样子的一个呃当代艺术的一个生根哈。那在进行的过程中，其实我想高美馆透过历任馆长的努力，也一直都在思索如何能够提出一个不一样的。所谓的比较趋近南方的一个观点哈，那同时也是在我们高美馆开馆的时候的典藏作品里面，事实上有包含了我们原住民的啊的，包括比较传统性的物件哈，也因为这一个时点，使得高美馆同时也长期的关心台湾原住民的当代艺术的一个发展。那这样子的一个呃双向的一个关心的路线，就是。生根在地，南台湾，好这样一个地域型的一个呃当代艺术的一个用心，跟结合呃台湾原住民的一个当代艺术的一个发展的一个呃关切哈的双轨之下，在二零零六年，其实透过我们原住民啊、呃、台湾原住民的这个呃语语系上的一个连接，得到了一个某一种国际化的一个的一个窗口，好。所以，也就是刚才啊，我们一开始有提到的这个二零零六年我们成立的这个南岛语系当代艺术计划啊，那这个是这个是这样子的一个背景。那十二年来，其实我们大概每一年平均都有一不不仅不管是针对南岛当代艺术的一个展览的呈现或者是研究，那近几年来有包括对台湾原住民的个展等等哈。那大家知道另外一个比较大的改变就是二零一六年我来接任馆长。那整个的背景就是，诚如我刚才说的，我们有一个长达二十几年的生根在地的一个这样的艺术的一个呃发展的一个基础，以及扩延在南岛当代艺术的这样子的一个呃想象哈。那呃大家也知道，其实呃我接任馆长的一个很重要的一个任务之一哈，就是推动二零一七年高美馆的行政变革哈，也就是从一个所谓的市立美术馆变。转变成为一个我们称为的行政法人，就是更强调专业的一个文化机构啊
呃，更脱离公部门的框架下，能够更专业的去思考文化艺术等等的这样子的一个我们称为的一个叫做呃呃公法人哈 ，public body。那也就在这样的前提底下，大家可能知道关心高美版的人，可能陆续看到从一七年、一八年，包括啊我们做的很大的空间的改造哈等等的呃空间的改造，那这跟当然也是啊、呃、反映在我认为美术馆的角色的不同哈，就是美术馆不只是一个看展览的地方而已，其实美术馆我觉得它更重要是一个生活场域的一个建构，在一个不同样的空间场域里面，我们才有机会去真正的看见艺术，跟艺术产生对话哈。那在这同时，我们也思考美术馆可以在怎么样的在我们的 program 上面去重新定位自己哈。那同时大家也知道，在近近年来全球的这种对所谓的一个南方南方学哈一个 global south 这样子的一个呃语境的一个兴起，那也因此让我们思考到刚才我提到的高美馆的过往的这二十几年来的这样的一个呃研究背景跟历史历史。那这样的基础之下，我们怎么我们如何能够再进一步的往世界发生，重新思考台湾的位置呢？也就是在这样的情况下，其实我们从二零一七年开始提出了一个新的美术馆的定位，好，这个定位就是在英文我们称为 South Plus， 好，那中文我们称为大南方，这样子的一个新的方向，去一方面思考南岛当代艺术之于高美馆，高美馆之于台湾。的一个重要性，因为其实对我们来讲，南岛艺术不只是，我想最重要的还是看见我们台湾原住民跟形塑整个台湾文化之间的关联性，这件事情才是最大的重点哈。那南岛艺术其实是一个呃引介点哈，也就是说，我我我在想着我们的那个艺术集会是，那个南岛艺术是一个出发点 （point of departure）， 但不是 end with Australasia。但不是结束在南岛艺术哈，我想那是一个界面，让我们去思考所谓的 global south， 也就是我们在思考的海洋文化啊。我们也谈了很多海洋文化，以及呃，包括些呃近年来在学界也相当兴盛的所谓的岛屿学哈，这些点种种的呃学术界的讨论，如何透过我们台湾确实有的原住民文化，能够去呃开启不一样的对当代艺术、对策展。对研究，特别是美术馆的研究的版图，怎么样的一个扩张哈？是今天的研讨会也延续到啊，我们二零二零年的呃大的国际艺术季的一个呃准备工作哈。那今天的议题，诚如大家知道，我们会谈从啊原住民当代艺术里面的所谓的当代性哈，然后原民性到底是什么？怎么样的对我们的不管在当代艺术的策展或是美术馆的研究上面？可以产生什么样的一个新的去面对全球化这样子的一个 universalizing 哈，一个 globalizing 一个啊均值化的一个啊论述方式。其实我们就是在谈多元史观、多元的观点。但其实当我们回到这个点上的时候，其实这个全球化的语境的一种均值化的一个状态，其实我想也是我们重新去思考啊，不管是透过。原住民艺术，或者是透过所谓的南岛当代艺术，这只是一个，我觉得是一个明点，是一个媒介，让我们去去思考当代艺术的创作还有什么其他的对话方式哈。那选在这个时间点其实也很重要，就是呃，诚如我刚才提到的，高美馆在过往里面确实是啊、呃，从二零零六年开始成立这个南岛艺术计划开始，我们的关照对象比较是法属那个 New Caledonia， 法属新克里多尼亚，包括纽西兰。斐济，好，包括我们跟毛利、毛利的艺术家们，其实在这个方面的互动是相当的多哈。但其实南岛，我们大家都知道，它整个扩延下来，从台湾北端起始，到最南端的纽西兰，然后西到马达加斯加，东到啊护国街道，这么大的广大海域里面，其实包括跟我们近邻的东南亚，我们在过往高美馆其实比较没有碰触到的。那所以当初会做这样子的一个啊安排，就是。特别是啊，我在二零一七年就已经也谈了要举办这个 Sun s h o w 啊，东南亚当代艺术的展览，从一九八四年至今哈，当初啊会跟日本的森美术馆共同合合作筹划办举办这一个展览，也是为我们的二零二零年的展览，其实也是某种程度是扣扣合在一起，也就是为什么我们这次的国际论坛特别选在 Sun s h o w 
开幕之后来举办哈。好，那大概是这样的一个背景哈，呃呃，做一个解释哈。那接下来我们就要很高兴的介绍今天的这个专题讲者哈 ，Dr. Zara s a m h o p 哈。那陈如刚才已经一再重复的，今天这场论坛其实是为了我们明年的这个国际艺术季哈，作为一个暖身的一个动作，也是为了那个一个想象而举办的哈。因此我们特别高兴能够邀请到呃 Dr. s a m h o p 我是在去年哈参加第九届的 APT 哈，就是 Asia Pacific Triennial， 是由。啊，澳洲布里斯本的昆士兰现代美术馆所举办的这一个很重要的以亚太艺术为主的一个当代艺术的一个三年展哈，他目前是呃这个美术馆的亚太艺术部门的策展经理，嗯、呃，同时他也是去年这一届哈，也就是二零一八年的亚太当代艺术三年展，就是我们称的 APT 的呃 Lead Curator 哈，首席策展人。那我们邀请他用亚太三年展这样的一个实实践，跟我们分享哈。因为其实事实上，我大概从呃九零年代哈，应该是前三届亚太三年展我都有去参观哈。然后去年又看了哈，就是亚太三年展，他当初出发的时候也是澳洲希望去举办这个所谓的泛国际性的一个当代艺术大展。可是，在这样子的一个想象里面，他聚焦澳洲自己本身的位置，以亚太就是 Asia Pacific 为。株洲，然后在这同时里面，他们其实大量的纳入这个原住民的元素哈。那从我第一次看到去年这一届，我一直在跟扎老分享，我觉得原住民的当代艺术的一个成长量是相当的大哈。可是他在整个呃当代艺术的语境的展出里面，又显得非常的产生了一种非常有趣多元的一个对话方式。在这点也是那时候我就觉得非常的。啊，受到启发，所以当时就特别邀请了 Zara 说：“哎，我们要办这个 symposium， 希望他能够来哈。”那很高兴今天能够就实现这一个梦想哈。那上周啊 ，Zara 跟我们分享了一个好消息哈。那所以应该是上两周了哈，就是他上周跟我们分享一个好消息，就是上周其实那个刚才我提到的这个昆士兰现代美术馆，现在称为跨沟嘛，好，被 Icon 被国际博物馆。协会选为二零一八年的澳洲最佳机构奖，哈，就是 Australia， 呃 ，Institution Australia Institutional Awards， 哈。而得奖的理由是，哈，他认为，哈，这个 Icon 认为，呃 ，APT 就是这个亚太三年展是澳洲唯一具备全球性重大意义的展览，而它具备全球性重大意义的展览，在于它把正统的艺术。因为中文翻成正统，所以我很好奇的回去看了一下英文，居然叫做 Orthodox， 我觉得本身是一个非常 dogmatic 的词句，叫 Orthodox Contemporary Art。它的主要成就在于把正统的当代作品与源自于传统的各式原住民，它原住民用的是 Aboriginal， 跟第一民族哈 First Nations 指的是加拿大的呃不同的原住民族，把这样子的。所谓的正统当代艺术，跟所谓的，呃，来自传统的不同形式的原住民艺术的一个呈现，并肩肩并肩的展出，是他获得了 Icon， 呃，整个的获奖的一个呃原因哈。那讲这么多，我想大家一定非常的期待听到 Dr. 呃 Sanho z a r a 的演讲哈。那在邀请他上台之前，我想我还是要简单的介绍一下他的丰富的。学经历背景哈，就简单的介绍一下。除了刚才我提到的，他是目前的这个跨沟嘛的亚太当代艺术的呃部门的 lead curator 之外，他同时也是二零一八年 APT 的策展人，同时他也即将担任二零二一年下一届，也就是第十届的 APT 啊，这让我们特别的期待哈。那同时他也是今年威尼斯双年展纽西兰呃纽西兰馆的那个首席策展人哈。与展出艺术家 Donna Michelle 合作推出的艺术计划 Post Hoc 啊，英中文翻译因果。那他的博士学位是来自于澳洲呃国立大学。那同时他也是皇家墨尔本理工大学与奥克兰科技大学艺术与设计学院的兼任教授哈。那在策展实务上，我想刚才已经提过，这都是超级巨大的呃重要的国际型的大展哈。之外，他其实也在在在很多不同的大学的博物馆。不管包包括担任创始馆长
或者是呃主要的策展人哈，那有非常多的策展的丰富的经历。那即将哈迎接亚太三年展的三十年哈，那我想我们真的很很兴奋的去期待 Zara 等一下要跟我们分享的这三十年来亚太三年展 APT 如何行硕帮助澳洲本来我想想看。一九九三年，当澳洲要成立一个国际型的三年展的时候，就有点像威尼双年展。我想很多人都会觉得脑中浮现一个 question mark。好，在这里面如何的努力经营澳洲加入这个所谓的某一种全球的当代艺术的对话语境的同时，里面他透过关注在地的多元丰富的文化，然后引引延展到。他们邀请的国家哈，我跟各位分享，今年的台湾的参展哈，呃，我如果没记错是有两位台湾的原住民当代艺术家参展，两位还是三位？那个伊德斯卢信跟应该是两位，等一下我讲错 ，Zara 可以修正我。就是这样子用透过这样子一个多元面貌的一个呈现，去展现的一种新的不一样的以当代艺术为主的国际艺术展的全球能量哈，我想在在这个点上是我们非常。期待也非常想要学习的哈，最后我想要引一句，就是 Zara 他说的哈，他对亚太三年展的一个想法就是，他认为这是一个去增强文化认知的机会，去展现地区的多元文化，还有社会所呈现的种种多元复杂的动能跟变迁的能力，为这整个地区的当代视觉艺术独特而多元的观点，重要的是提供一个展示记录跟讨论的集会所。我想，我也用这样子的一句话来期待我们自己明年的二零二零年泛南岛哈，这是一个 working title 的呃呃国际艺术季哈。好，那很长的介绍了 Zara， 我们热烈掌声欢迎 Zara 为我们分享，谢谢。Hello。Thank you, uh, Director Yulin Lee, for your very generous, lengthy introduction. And yes, in the, the APT, the Asia Pacific Triennial that just finished at Queensland Art Gallery, we did have three artists from Taiwan, one of which I will touch on. Thank you also um, to Wee Ling for her help in bringing me here. I've just come to you from occupied Brisbane in Queensland, Australia the land of the Jagora and Turbal people on the Maywa River. Before I begin, I would very much like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of this place. This is the Queensland Art Gallery building on that river, which was established in the 1980s. And it, we have a campus of two buildings, also the Gallery of Modern Art. And hence together, the museum itself is called the Gallery of Modern Art, and I'll just call it Quake Goma for this purpose. In my role at Quake Goma, and I'm not an indigenous uh, person in Australia, I was responsible for the last Asia Pacific Triennial and as Yulin said, these uh, we can abbreviate to APT, just to make that a bit shorter. APT number nine, which concluded in April this year. Of all the many roles I needed to play to deliver that exhibition, curator, manager, morning tea organiser, bad cop, good cop, follower, leader, writer, etc. The one for which there was no precedent or guideline was facilitating the indigenous cultural welcome, an image of which you see here. A welcome to Maywa for all our visiting Indigenous and First Nation artists. It's very important that we make the gallery space a safe cultural space for artists' work. It's important also that we ensure our Indigenous visitors are welcomed by representatives of the local traditional owners, as this is an expected protocol and a space is given in the proceedings for cultural exchange if it should be wanted by our guests. And here's some of the responders from those visitors at the time of the cultural welcome. Such welcomes must occur prior to the formal exhibition opening. This was my first APT. I had only started at Quake Goma 18 months beforehand. 
and on an elevated scale and importance due to a number of, due to the number of artists and the mix of peoples that we were hosting from Australia, Taiwan, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Papua, Torres Strait, Okinawa, Taiwan and many other areas. Apart from my not having had a chance to meet many of the local Indigenous elders, there was also a tension in Brisbane as there's three particular lang Indigenous language groups that hold claim over that area. So which one speaks is very important, or how they speak together. The Asia Pacific Triennial was established in 1993, and here you can see some of the aims which were outlined in the third publication. Implicit in these founding aims are such ongoing institutional and professional learnings, such as I just mentioned to you for myself, for Quagoma and its staff. Maybe it can be read between the lines of these objectives here. And I'm sorry there's no translation for this slide. Creating new audience awareness of Asian art in particular has dominated the beginnings and the establishment of the APT. As at the time, in the early 90s, contemporary art from Asia was very unfamiliar to our audiences and population. Um, but also the Pacific was as well, but the Asian element of it seemed to dominate conversation. So a little bit more about the Queensland Art Gallery and Indigenous Art. Craig Goma has been working with Australian Indigenous artists and collecting and exhibiting their work for many, many decades. It has more recently formalised this Indigenous engagement in a public strategy document that you can find online if you um, Google the Queensland Art Gallery and also an Indigenous advisory panel who work with the director. There's about six or seven um, members of that panel and it was established in 2015 in time for the eighth Asia Pacific Triennial. The panel helped to steer the organisation's engagement with all matters of Australian Indigenous concern and that includes uh, mainland uh, Aboriginal people and also Torres Strait Islands to the north of Australia who are included in Indigenous Peoples of Australia. This panel of the people who would tell me if I was heading in the direction, rightly or wrongly, when I was organising the APT number nine and also its welcome. This navigation is needed for many reasons. Quay Goma is an art museum established in 1895, it's a 19th century institution, on a colonial European model, initially completely disconnected from the indigenous culture in which it was situated and which the governing power sought to destroy. Indigenous people in Australia were not legally considered citizens, you might know this, or be able to vote until 1962. Of around the 300 original Indigenous languages, only 60 are healthy today. After over a century, most staff and all management at Quagoma are of European background or Australian European background, and, and visibly Australian Indigenous people inside the organisation remain very low. It's predominantly our curators of Australian Indigenous art. The institution reports to the state government and there's little evidence of decolonising the vision of that government or of the institution itself, purpose or operations, above complying with policies such as reconciliation action plans. We're more successful working with the rich Indigenous cultures in Queensland and nationally as artists and that's where we put our energy in working people to people, face to face and with artist concerns. There's also the complexity, as I said, of being accountable to three language groups or tribes in our particular area. So in Australia, Indigenous art is particularly important because it is the voice of people who are otherwise often excluded from uh, dialogues, local and national. In this context, Indigenous art is precious in maintaining culture and being one forum for people who are being silenced, obliterated and discriminated against. Increasingly, Indigenous art is absent Sorry, interestingly, Indigenous art is absent from the initial aims of the APT. You don't really see it written here. The focus is on Asia and the Pacific and bringing those, that region into a sort of vision uh, in Brisbane at the gallery. Also, Australian art as a whole is the smallest component of any Asia Pacific triennial. These are just a few facts and figures, and I haven't um, separated out Australian art within the total number of artists, but it gives you a sense in that 
first column of how many artists were included in each APT. Yet I suggest that the Asia Pacific Triennial would never have commenced without the strong presence of Indigenous art in the contemporary art sector in Australia and particularly Brisbane, where um, we probably overstate with one of the largest Indigenous populations in Australia. And also the fact that Indigenous art of Australian artists was a field already established in Australian art museums. The public were comfortable with it, it's in private collections already several decades ago and there were specialist commercial art galleries dealing in uh, Indigenous art from remote places and urban centres in Australia as well. The status and appreciation of Australian Aboriginal art has a relatively short history. Very briefly, anthropologists led the push for Aboriginal art to be considered fine art, compiling large collections in the early 20th century. A nationalist agenda post-World War II, in which Aboriginal designs became popularised, was an added encouragement. So at that time, there was a lot of designs which were appropriated and they were put into popular culture elements um, from fabrics to um, art, other artworks as well. Alongside the visibility of the paintings of Central Desert artist Albert Namajira, who you might have heard of in the 1940s, Anthropologists pushed for a government-organised Aboriginal art market as a means for Aboriginal people to achieve economic independence and be identified as individual artists. So you have to think this is before Aboriginal people had citizenships. Critics were not interested until the six state art galleries in Australia, which include Queensland Art Gallery, purchased their first works in the 1950s, donated by anthropologist Charles Mountford. The Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, especially, was a leader acquiring a significant collection. However, it took until the 1980s for Aboriginal art to be appreciated in its own right and not to be responded to by European Australians through the aesthetic imperatives of Western modernism. In the late 1980s, state gallery directors went on to record that Aboriginal art was the most interesting aspect of Australian art. The new interest of writers, academics and critics fueled research, publishing and gave a forum for artists, encouraged new ways of working using European art materials as well, and subsequently national and international exhibitions and a market. And this was all still largely um, controlled and managed by the European Australian population. In 2011, scholar of contemporary Indigenous art, uh, Ian McLean, titled a book of writings on Australian Aboriginal contemporary art, how Aborigines invented <coughs> the idea Excuse me. How Aborigines invented the idea of contemporary art. So as an established genre of contemporary art, Indigenous Australian art prepared the way for lesser known art from the Pacific and Asia, I would say, at the, at the Asia Pacific Triennial. This little potted history can't do justice to the decades of change in Australia. But the significant points for discussion are that contemporary Aboriginal art has forged a new paradigm in Australia that painting and subsequently other media from artists in remote locations was identified as art from the 1980s. This turning point meant that Indigenous art was not thought of in anthropological terms, nor as primitive or traditional or tribal, but it could exercise its own aesthetic appeal and be contemporary, even if the content includes cultural, spiritual and other knowledge passed down for tens of thousands of years. And um, recently, or currently in Australia, the, the thinking is that Indigenous people, Aboriginal people, have been on the continent for somewhere between 60 and 80,000 years. This art subsequently evolved in a contemporary context and not out of a European or Euro-American model of art history. As Maud Page, who was very involved with at least the first six or seven Asia-Pacific triennials, as curator and deputy director said, the visibility and success of Aboriginal art has transformed the way that Australians understand modern and contemporary art. Its diversity of practice, strong formless sensibility and inclusion of customary objects as part of its ambit have created productive dialogues, some of which also inform contemporary Pacific art. Indigenous is not a label that we always apply to artists. In fact, uh, it's very rarely applied unless an artist itself wants to be known as an Indigenous artist. <clears throat> and definitions have been, words, language and terminology have been 
something that has been an ongoing question that's been worked through various different Asia-Pacific triennials, and I think something that we're still today finding a, an ongoing uh, concern and interest. But works by artists have dismantled the boundaries of many terms, such as Indigenous. Each APT has introduced audiences to art and artists from many locales, cultures and ways of being, allowing for an ever-changing engagement with this wide region. So because I don't have a lot of time today, I'm just going to focus on some of the works of the Australian Indigenous artists that have been in the triennials across time, and also works by some Pacific artists as well, just because maybe they're um, slightly newer to you and um, I won't have time to go into the works by a many Asian artists also. But I think this is appropriate for our discussion. So at the start, the first uh, Asia-Pacific triennials were conceived by a small number of curators working at, with co-curators in Asia, the Pacific and other locations. And they did categorise artists by the nation, the formal nation that they came from, for Taiwan or Japan or Papua New Guinea. But very rapidly that structure was dismantled so that artists' works were presented without a framework of nationalism, but more presenting the artwork itself as being the most important part of the artist's practice. The first Asia-Pacific Triennial included 76 artists or collaborations and was the only time that artists were identified by nation or country. Despite my privileging of Australian art saying that this is how the Asia-Pacific Triennial really came into being, the section on Australian artists in the first APT was marginalised at the back of the publication and only four of the 76 artists were Australian Aboriginal artists. I'm just going to turn to the Pacific here for a moment in the first APT, and this is a work by Robin Kawakiwa from Aotearoa, New, New Zealand. The proportionally large contingent from uh, Aotearoa included Maori artist Robin Kiwaka, Kawakia, a Ngāti Paro artist, with work she described as being about identity and being a Maori woman in society today. Tine Māoriora is typically political of this artist, alluding to how the founding document of Bicultural New Zealand, the Treaty of Waitangi, which I'm sure Ruben will be talking about more, has not been honoured by the European New Zealanders, Pākehā. Indigenous sovereignty is an issue embedded in many First Nations artists' work in the global south, and we see it repeated again in Australian Indigenous artists' work, artists from New Zealand and, and many other parts as well. The other Pacific artists in that first triennial were from Papua New Guinea. There were two of them. The first represented really the first generation of contemporary artists who were untrained, uh, Matthias Kwaje, and the second, the artist in this side, artists who had studied at art school, and this is Joe Nalo. Nalo's paintings draw on traditional legends. to do with the sea and underwater conditions, while also alluding to some wider social or ethical issues. Of the, of the four Indigenous artists in that first triennial, three were Pachare sisters from Utopia in Central Australia, who exhibited and painted with their own personal styles, but grounded in their own individual custodial responsibilities for their country or their place, place that they're connected to ancestrally, and the ceremonies for land, dreaming and relationships to that place. In establishing the Asia Pacific Triennial, the then Queensland Art Gallery Director Doug Hall and the Gallery Trustees had a vision for three iterations. They only planned to do three triennials. So the second of those triennials was part of an ongoing discussion that interrogated the tensions between tradition and change. And these two words were um, parts of sort of ideas that appeared many times in discussions across those first triennials, thinking about the histories that artists were drawing on and what was making their work new or innovative, how their work was changing from the past. The second APT was structured with three sections instead of nations in the first one. It grouped artists under East Asia, South and Southeast Asia and the Pacific and the Pacific included the Australian artists and featured three Indigenous artists and projects. 
One of those was by the Campfire Group that you can see here, which included Australian and Torres Strait Islander artists, a number of artists. And what they did is for the whole duration, about four months of the triennial, they set up this truck outside the gallery, uh, they made work inside the truck, and then they sold it from the truck in an auction-like way, a sort of black market, art market in front of the gallery. <clears throat> All stock must go, it was called, like a sale. And the comment uh, was really on the cash economy that was coming out of people selling Indigenous artists' work on a sort of black market, and the lack of artists, Indigenous artists, also being inside the gallery. So their statement about being outside was quite deliberate, saying, you know, we're not invited inside the institution. Another work was by Destiny Deacon, an urban Aboriginal artist from Melbourne. She's got a North Queensland and Torres Strait Islander background. And she recreated her whole living room. She took it from Melbourne and brought it up into the gallery and installed it there for the second triennial. The installation humorously asserted her presence in an art museum with the intention of reworking stereotypes of Indigenous people. In her words, she wanted to show how the other half live. In Australia, Indigenous artists continue in different ways, strategically using art to assert their presence and the individual selves into conversations. So by contrast, the curators of this triennial grouped together artists' works from Aotearoa New Zealand, and they made a sort of grouping of work by male artists and a grouping of female artists, which included both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, Maori and Pacific, and Pākehā artists from New Zealand in each of those groups. It was a little unfortunate, and that has never happened again in an APT, because the individual artists' works sort of lost their identity when they were grouped together. Um, so it didn't receive a very good critical response. And here you can see in this slide some great works in the Water Mall area, which is running alongside the river in the gallery. It's a big, uh, like a pond where artwork can be installed. So works by, car big carving by Brett Graham in the foreground there. Um, stone works by Chris Booth and other artists as well. So tradition has been an ongoing platform in APT in a way, but tradition fused with current thinking and maybe contemporaneity of artists who are coming from uh, drawing on their own stories, often uh, maybe legends as well, mythology, but also something very contemporary about their work. And Eric Natuoevi's work from um, Vanuatu is perhaps typical of that in the early APTs. And these are ceramics that this artist makes, and they're holding uh, tusks of pigs, the pig tusks. And for him, or in that culture, they're quite a traditional symbol of status and wealth, and they also appear, appear on the flag of Vanuatu. But here, putting together um, the ceramics and the wood and the tusks, this artist has introduced a new symbolism to the use of the materials. For here, he was trying to denote the changing status of women in his society and the fact that they've sort of risen up from subservience to having much more empowered status in Vanuatu society, much more equality. Uh, and still with APT2, uh, Denise Tiavuane from um, the Pacific and from New Caledonia. I've included this work, uh, it's a very uh, old slide you can see, but I included this work because feminism has been a very strong current in artists' works in the Pacific for quite a long time and it's getting stronger and stronger. But it's not to overlook the fact that there always has been a strong female presence, particularly in some matriarchal societies. Denise's installation, The Crying Taros, was a garden of taro, a crop important to sustain life in the Pacific and tended lar largely by women. Here she's implanted the taro plants with microphones and the microphones played laments of women from her region uh, songs, um, talking about their place in New Caledonia. And finally for APT to René Bhutan, again from New Caledonia, an artist who really questions uh, many things going on in his society using a mix of materials. Often he used elements such as oil and water and blood, but in this work he's included very large whale bones you can see in the background, so we get a sense of his interest in perhaps the the, the conflict, the tension between traditional, um, traditional sustenance and working with the sea, but also the fact of wanting to care for that environment as well. 
I think one of the, the interesting things about APT is the responses that it generates from the public, from art critics, from artists as well. And these um, perhaps came to a fore with the idea of artists and work that was included that very much feels to some people like folk art or vernacular art. And in, this came uh, perhaps to a head with the third Asia Pacific Triennial, where we really stepped into new waters for art museums in including uh, what we've always termed vernacular art, by artists working outside the art museum, outside the museum system, outside art training, and coming from often uh, remote areas as well. Vernacular is often associated with timeless tradition, tribal forms outside history, and problematically other for that reason, which I think we've confronted and tried to change around that thinking. And here, this is a slide of Indian artist Sonabai, who came to Brisbane from a village of Chatsragar in remote central India. She was selected by an Indian curator, uh, external curator, Jotindra Jan, who previously worked with her and in fact had included her work in some, uh, was starting to include her work in um, cities like Paris and other um, institutions in Europe. So Sonabai recreated the types of screens, screens she had made of bamboo and wood on her home and she was the first woman in her uh, village to do this, to really rework a traditional form, which were covered in sculpted and painted figures and reliefs made in local clay. The gallery saw this as a strong statement in recognising different histories and questioning definitions of contemporary art. But as I said, it did divide critics. I think for the APT, uh, the inclusion of this type of work indicated the openness to many temporalities found in hybrids of tradition and innovation within contemporary art and a determined disregard for ethnographic categories. Performance is of course an integral part of culture um, in the Pacific and Australia and elsewhere as well. And often artists in APT are mostly being seen through performative works and not works in the white cube. Dance and rituals blend traditions with new forms and have been informed by contemporary life to shift by degrees away from historical customs. Lawrence Pertain and four artist performers felt that APT was a place where they could show the distinctiveness of New Ireland culture from Papua New Guinea and how it has been maintained amongst the many multifaceted peoples indigenous to Papua New Guinea. Pertang's project, Cargos, involved the construction of a spirit house and a series of masks. The masks were first worn by the audience and then by the artists and performers in a number of rituals and performances before being left in the house inside the gallery that they had created. Artists hoped that the work would be a disturbance a personal experience of visitors opening their mind to the singularity of people with different languages and cultural practices. And that's very much in contrast uh, with another uh, performance that happened in APT5, which was choreographed by the CEO of a contemporary dance company, Bangara Dance Company, who have been practicing now for a couple of decades in Australia. They work in big theatres, they work very much in the theatre and performance sector. And Stephen Page, the CEO, choreographed this performance for the Asia Pacific Triennial, uh, working with his son and his six nephews. And they were dancing on a burnt out car in a theatre space just like this. Um, and it was a music filled exploration of um, many of the issues facing young Aboriginal youth. And it was really the first time that those young boys had danced together and that they'd even danced in a context like this. The very different types of performative work seen together. And at this time, for the fifth APT, the gallery opened that second building, the Gallery of Modern Art, which is uh, quite a large building. So it enabled a very extensive expansion of the APT uh, and had theatre spaces and many other uh, spaces that artists could use. This is just a small section of the Pacific Textiles project in that fifth APT which was representative of some of the most current forms of making in the Pacific. <coughs> Textiles are often synonymous with the nations from which they come from, to Vai Vai from the Cook Islands, to Fai Fai from Tahiti, Kapakuki from Hawaii, 
and other local names for quilts. While the making of bark cloth, or tarpa, as it's uh, often called, was a primary form of cultural expression in pre-colonial Polynesia, textile making retains many designs from these early patterns, while also continuing to create new forms beyond the incorporation of needlework traditions that were introduced by missionaries and European culture. These works, and you might think that they appear fairly ordinary, <clears throat> are not only objects born of labour and shared communal expertise, but they also refer in their patterns to the history, the faith and the desires for sovereignty in nations that came into being through the acts of imperialist and colonial agents. The work on the top left, uh, the blue divivai, hanging on the wall there, is a work by Gussie R. Bento from Hawaii, the crown and the kahili of Kami Hamiha the fourth, uh, made around 1980. And it refers to King Kamehameha, who reigned from 1855 to 1863 as the last Hawaiian monarch, who was defeated in his attempt to retain the identity of his people. Such works are not only precious, delicate works that resist the globalising forces of mass production, because today you can buy quilts, you don't need to make them, so the actual making of these quilts is a sort of resistance. They also keep religious and national sovereign faith alive. The work in the front, the mats in the front part of this slide here, are cross-generational, made by mother and daughter. The technical diversity of the mats in the use of fibre and fabrics celebrates cultural diversity, tradition and language, and the mediation of new meanings of home and belonging. These mats have been part of a history of exchanging mats, which are remembered, and they also constitute histories of exchange, genealogy, and political history. So works like this, of course, contrast um, the much more art school trained artists who are often working in much more conceptual ways. And a slide here of Michael Parakofi's work from Aotearoa, New Zealand as well, in APT5. Um, just to show you, I guess, the contrasting types of work that artists are making across the Pacific. And it's often this sort of work that gets picked up and seen in projects like you know, the Venice Biennale and internationally uh, compared to that Pacific Textiles project. It's a little difficult to see, but these are works by Australian artist Tracy Moffat. Um, and they're part of APT6, which really expanded the reach of the APT into West Asia and it included some new countries such as Tibet, Turkey, Iran, Cambodia, and Myanmar for the first time. But also Australian artists, of course. And Tracy Moffat is an artist who wants to be known as a contemporary artist. She has an Indigenous background, but for her, she's been very strongly resilient since uh, several decades ago that she used to be called a contemporary artist and not an Indigenous artist. Although her videos and images, um, particularly here and in an ongoing way, show a very dark and ambiguous side of what usually seems to be a post-colonial situation, uncertain desires and power relationships as well. The sophistication of practice from Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, was just mentioned before with Michael's work, but it was very evident in APT6 as well. And this is a great, um, enormous work by Reuben Patterson, a glittering, dazzling work created for APT that's layered with personal and cultural symbology. So a very large painting, but and filled with um, glittery forms as well. But it includes fabric patterns from his mother's dresses, merged with Maori traditional forms, such as kawhai fai, which you would know the patterns from the rafter painting in Maori meeting houses, uh, the idea of dark centers and voids, in a way that reinvests cultural specificity and symbolic power that is both cultural and personal. And by contrast here, this is a work, I'm sorry it's a little hard to see in the slide here, but it's a, a beautiful, very large-scale tarpa cloth, which is again made by an artist um, from New Zealand, Robin White, who's been collaborating for a long time with Fijian bark cloth artist Leva Tokai. Since 2000, I think they've been working together. And they're both known now for these amazing, detailed, very contemporary tarpa, which sometimes are very extensive, as wide as this stage. Um, and they're both women of the Baha'i faith, which informs their work. This particular cloth um, acknowledges the complex histories of cultural interaction, and it looked 
at really at the how the um, modern sugar industry in Fiji had brought different cultures together and how that industrialization had made an impact on culture there. This group of works, I've just called the Vanuatu sculptures, really again made present the sacred and the ritual as ideas that are very current in terms of um, some ongoing practice. These sculptures perpetrate the notion of APT perpetuating connections between innovation and tradition. Carved from the trunks of breadfruit and black plum trees, the spirit and guardian sculptures, which are the ones uh, on the left, are created in a reaffirmation of custom, which really is the bringing together of customary government, law and religion on the island of Ambram. The carvings are part of a historic process of artistic creation and renewal for the Ambram people. Their styles developed as part of complex inter-island canoe trading and intermarriage. This was the first time that these works had appeared in any art museum. And only men who have passed through various levels of initiation have the right to carve these works that signify various rankings or certain important uh, figures and ancestors as well. By contrast, performance again, and this was a whole um, performative series of reggae from across the Pacific, where reggae has been very important in terms of um, thinking about culture and political rights. And uh, it was uh, led by a man who's particularly infused Kanak culture with reggae and uh, the force of Rastafarian sound, bringing together a number of performers, which of course is hugely popular uh, with our local audiences. I'm just moving through these couple of APTs quite quickly and then I will we'll show some images of the most recent APT. But this seventh one had an emphasis on ephemeral structures and transitory spaces. It was also very full with suggestions of regeneration, re-evaluation and renewal in regard to two major commissioned structures by Eblam and Kuoma artists from the East Sepik province of Papua New Guinea as well as masks from New Britain and Sepik. And you can see uh, these structures and some carvings here. The collaborative projects that were put together by quite large numbers of uh, groups of people. And the idea of structures, bringing structures and building them in the gallery to um, show some of these important contemporary contexts. This was the largest group of works from Papua New Guinea in any Pacific Triennial. But of course there was um, still that core of Australian and Australian Indigenous artists and the 7th ABT comprised the largest contingent of, Austra of Indigenous artists from Australia. Five out of the seven Australian artists were Indigenous and this included Shirley McNamara whose beautiful structure, woven structure we can see here and Tiwi artist Timothy Cook, way from the North um, Islands above Australia, who works uh, with these circular images which relate to ceremony and particularly the moon god Japara. Timothy also uh, had created a performance in the gallery in front of his work uh, with members of his own community. Of course there were works again from Aotearoa New Zealand and across the Pacific, multifaceted um, pro practices, particularly Felipe Toe, Toe, that I'm showing here, a Tongan artist who resides in New Zealand. And his forms look at the history of um, tying of senet, which is a hand-rolled cord made from coconut husk, uh, which is, is quite common to find uh, in areas of the Pacific. And Toe looks at the patterns, the sort of cross, uh, cross patterns that happen in lashing uh, and the use of the senet across the Pacific and the way that they might be holders of memory as well as thinking about journeys and travels across the sea. Um, similarly, APT 8 included works in all media from Indigenous uh, Australia, Torres Strait and the Pacific. There's some lovely works here by Gwynby Gan Ganbamba, who works a lot uh, not only on poles but also using uh, materials from closed industrial sites in Australia where his people live. And some of the work you can't see here lying flat is made on rubber from a production line that would have been turning around in a mining area 
and he's carved into the sheets of rubber as well to um, give them a tr traditional pattern. Other artists working in different media included Dane Mellor from Queensland, uh, urban artist Book Andrew, and Book is perhaps the first artist to be curating a Biennale in Sydney, the Sydney Biennale, which will take place next year. Richard Bell working in video, and here he is with um, figures that are satirising the art world, and this is in Venice. Sika Passe from Mia, uh, painting his island and bringing that to people. Nicholas Mole from Kanak, people who created an amazing in the round installation with video where dancers would appear out of the, um, the vegetation. A big dance project, Yumi Danis, uh, a Savage Club, which is a take on a traditional colonial gentleman's club, but activated by a uh, New Zealand artists who brought a lot of different um, collaborators and performers and activated that space. Rosanna Raymond, her name. Angela Tiatia, who also works in uh, New Zealand. And the video on the left was about one of the last workshops uh, where people such as her family had been working in uh, precarious workshops, sewing for the, um, for the uh, fabric industry. Yuki Kihara, whose work, work is well known, Samoan artist living in New Zealand. But also included again vernacular art from India, which was a time to again look at that conversation about what, how art is included, how art's seen and understood uh, in different parts of the world. And there were artists from Rajasthan, West Bengal, Bihar, and Maja Pradesh, who basically were working in different ways in two dimensional imagery uh, and bringing stories that they had been working with, developing, and sharing in their own communities to Brisbane in two dimensional image form. So returning to my mention of APT9, where I started, and the cultural welcome. This cultural welcome comprised two parts. The first one I don't have any images of. It was getting together in the morning and local indigenous people welcoming our visiting artists to Maywa, to that place, and telling them something about the culture there and the history, and walking around and giving people a chance to talk to each other. This is the second part, which is really a smoking ceremony. Um, I didn't have any slides of the smoke, but basically the idea of the welcome is that uh, smoke is lit, people walk through it to cleanse themselves before they work into the gallery space. They're led into the space by our, our leaders, including our curator of Indigenous art on the right, Bruce McLean, um, and then within the space, some welcomes and singing take place, and people can also respond and interact. Everyone was also given gifts, so given a, um, a feather, uh, neck piece made by a local um, senior female figure. So in APT9, Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists retained a really strong presence. And I can say that I had to fight for that. I had to fight for the fact that we didn't include any European Australian artists in the last APT9. And I was really quite proud that um, more than 10% of the APT was uh, Australian Indigenous artists. And they made some, we had some fantastic work included in that APT. Ale Pandagan from the Whit people in northern Queensland with a flying fox installation, a sculptural work. Uh, he and his people, his uh, patriarchal line, are known as carvers, and so these uh, beautiful carvings were suspended in the gallery space. Jonathan Jones, who's a Wurundjeri artist from New South Wales, working with language in a collaborative work with an older. This work particularly is about the retention and the, and the strength of language and how we understand the world through language. It's called Untitled Garan, and the word Garan is the word for wind in Wurundjeri language. And there was sounds of wind in, in this installation. There was language spoken by Uncle Stan. And it's about really connecting to the world and understanding it through the structures and the languages that we all create for ourselves. Was it a beautiful beautiful immersive installation, 44 channel sound work, and um, 2,000 objects that Jonathan made using a redwood, <coughs> stones, traditional indigenous implements, and also feathers, feathers that people around Australia collected for him and sent to him to create this project. You can see him installing it there. 
But this, that, import, that project was really important because this year is a uh, year of Indigenous languages and so we're really hoping to continue to develop our audience understanding of uh, Indigenous languages in Australia. The Caribbean Film Collective is just a group here, are a collective who work in very central Australia and make videos on their mobile phones together, talk about things that are important to them, which sometimes are very political, very local, but also connect, of course, into all of our lives. Lola Greeno, an Indigenous artist from Tasmania, right at the bottom of Australia, that little island hanging off um, the end, where she's been working for all her life, really creating um, body adornment from local shells, continuing a practice that was nearly lost over time, and now she is the senior figure working in this way uh, in Australia. Two sisters from Yellingimbi again in the north of Australia, 160 and 180 years old, and they've been passed down their father's stories, and they've started to work with painting and poles, but they're known particularly for their weaving, and particularly the black dye that they use, which creates this amazing shimmer on their baskets and uh, jelly bags. James Tyler, who's a quieter person from sort of South Australian region, but also part Maori, part European. So his works look at that intersection of cultures across the Pacific. He works a lot with photography, and now he's also started researching food and creating different uh, foods from uh, existing local ingredients. A project that we did in the Marshall Islands with weavers and the University of South Pacific, encouraging women to create new jacket weaving, uh, which has had a resurgence in the, micro, in the Marshall Islands. And an amazing project called Women's Wealth, which our curator, Ruth McDougall, curated with the Bougainville woman, Salon of Barlai, which brought together 22 women from Bougainville in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. And Bougainville is an interesting uh, place to think about in terms of indigeneity. Bougainville being part of Papua New Guinea, but at the moment trying to become autonomous, trying to become a separate nation, because they really feel that they don't associate with the rest of that landmass. They feel closer to people in the Solomon Islands who are now a different nation because when Germany divided up that part of the Pacific, they put a border between Bougainville and Solomon Islands. So although the people themselves are very similar, they come from different nations now uh, in, in a legal sense. So it was a very complex project in bringing women together, finding women and um, allowing them to make the sorts of works that they are making at the moment, which is uh, keeping their culture strong and making innovation. And these are two too, which are rain hoods, which uh, people wear, made out of pandanus. That's the group of women. There they work together in a Christian centre to make the work. Uh, they also included some of the first drawings from Boga Hill, artists who started working with European materials. But really the project was about uh, the women's creation and the women uh, as the strength of culture there and re reviving and keeping strong their culture. And the gallery uh, with those women and some young photographers uh, mentored them to film the women and create an interactive website that you can go to on our uh, Queensland Art Gallery website and see the places that the women come from and hear them talking about their work and see some of that project in process. A great video by Tawoi Havini, who lives in Sydney, but she's a Bougainville woman. So she's here, that's one of uh, her family in the video. She's really setting the scene for that project, which is um, objects predominantly. And Janet Fieldhouse, um, living in Australia, but also Bougainville, who's a ceramic artist who was part of that project, working together with those women in uh, Bougainville. And other artists, of course, from the Pacific, Lisa Rehana, who's well known for this work, In Pursuit of Venus Infected, a North Large Scale um, Moving Image work. Arita Wilkinson, another Maori artist from New Zealand who made a beautiful project. She brought those stones from New Zealand to Australia. They're part of her river and her place and her identity. And in the gallery, she worked on those stones to create new forms of body adornment with copies of tools that are ancient ancient Maori tools have been found and are now in Oxford in the museum there. So an amazing project to bring together all these elements to experiment and create new body adornment works. Kapalani Langraf, a kind of um, Hawaii artist looking at the change and the difficulties for Indigenous people in Hawaii in collage form. And Chris Jarvis, who's um, 
an artist in New Zealand who thought he was Maori but found out he was from Kiribati background and works that he and collaborators have um, created to think about forms that are often functional in Kiribati but are the aesthetic forms that he says is important for understanding uh, art for himself from that place. So a fish trap in the front made with shells, swords uh, that are quite playful in the background, um, it dresses as well and works with coconut fibre. And a project, collaborative project, uh, Arab Lifu between um, peoples from um, Torres Strait and the New Caledonian Islands who found out historically that they would have had um, intersections travelling across the seas and have recently started to work together to create large drawing works like this, which are intersection cultural projects. And now Ushigara from Okinawa, very staunchly Indigenous Okinawan artist, group of her works. And finally, Ines Lawson from Taiwan, of course, um, who's sort of Tribu and Ateol heritage. And we were really pleased that Idas was part of this APT9 project. And I just want to finish um, a little bit. I hope that's given you some insight into APT. It's gone some way to fulfill uh, the aims that it set for itself. And yet I think um, it's done more than that in terms of raising debate and looking at indig what indigeneity might be. It supported Indigenous artists of many cultures and practices to engage with our Australian audiences, to make work that resists quietly or overtly local imperialism or colonialism by showing strength of sovereign histories and cultures. APT has brought many artists to Brisbane to share their stories and perform their cultures. The exhibition itself has contributed to dialogues that have started to dismantle boundaries, but I think create also more questions. But certainly looking at categorisations of current art as folk, craft, anthropological or ethnographic and showing also that tradition still has a place in lives today. As curator of Indigenous art, Bruce McLean has written, the APT project allows First Nations narratives to be read alongside other histories and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artist voices to add to and to benefit from critical engagement with these important dialogues. APT doesn't discriminate between the sacred, the spiritual and the secular when it appears in contemporary creativity. Focus really is on the best presentation of the artist's work. The event in the gallery now has a history of presenting art that I think is a disruptor that challenges accustomed Western ways of thinking about art in a chronological and categorical fashion and makes space for histories, genealogies and politics of resistance rightly central to much art by Indigenous, First Nations and marginalised people. As important as the work on show are the dialogues with the makers, their communities, their collaborators and audiences. The questions engendered from early in the APT program still remain. Who speaks and who is listening? I just want to finish on the work of one artist from Vietnam, as I've hardly mentioned eight artists from Asia in this presentation. Nguyen Trinity is a provocator in the ongoing dialogue on indigeneity and its contemporaneity that we must attend to. Her new work, this fifth Cinema was presented in APT9, and this is just one still from the work. This actually shows her daughter. It was made, this work, Fifth Cinema, was made from the perspective of a Vietnamese female filmmaker embedded in a nation that's been divided and rejoined during its modernity and historically home to many indigenous peoples. Comprising clips from international movies and documentary and found footage of modern and contemporary Vietnam, spliced with her own filming, Fifth Cinema asks, what is an indigenous Vietnam? Nguyen was inspired by meeting Maori artists in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and particularly hearing about the work of Gary Barclay, indigenous filmmaker. However, her film claims no lineage, but operates as a metaphor for things oppressed, women, minorities, the colonised. And the impossibility in this time of long histories and movements of people of addressing indigeneity using generalisations. The unknown, the invisible, the inaccessible, potentialities, these are the qualities that the best art holds and the realities institutions must face and present. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks very much. Thank you.
谢谢莎拉非常精彩的分享哈。那他。这次，而且比较 focus 在呈现，就是所谓的，不管是原住民身份的艺术家，在整个 A P T 呃九届的一些呈现哈。可事实上，在整个 A P 的那个大的的场景里面，它其实跟很多不一样的当代艺术的一个并置哈。那我想今天在分享的部分，它有点侧偏这一个部分啊，但是它在整个演讲还是有呃一再的强调这个呃原住民的比例。事实上，在它的这个 A P T 的这个当代艺术的。的的呈现上的那个逐渐的提升跟不同的展展展现方式，我觉得真的是非常好的，给了我们即将要做的二零二零的艺术季很多的一些想象跟方法上的一个呃推进哈。那我们是不是 ？So I ask her. Is there any can take some question from the floor? 谢谢。可以说吗？好，可以。我们请那个陈建北老师哈。呃。你说说哪里？先谢谢，先谢谢。第一个带来这么精彩的演讲啊，呃，我的问题就是说，刚才从他所呃秀出来的图片里面哈、啊，我觉得很多作品在在展览场的呈现，它其实是非常的活泼的，非常的不是那么的知识化的，好、啊，我们可以看到，就很多作品它其实有呃，就形式就就展台来讲，就光线来讲。其实我觉得，呃，在这么几届里面，其实这些作品都非常精彩啊。呃，我的问题是要问，就是说，当一个艺术家他把作品做出来的时候，他进来美术馆，然后就是做一个策展人，你怎么，你怎么让你的艺术家跟你磨合，把作品在美术馆做一个最好的呈现？这是第一个问题。那我的第二个问题是哈，当然在艺术界的所有的朋友们都知道。没有足够的经费，其实是很难去做一个非常非常好的展览。而且，像你们测的这样的这些展览，其实你有引用了大量的不同地区的艺术家。我的好奇是，你们给的创作经费是多少？然后给艺术家创作的时间，在呈现您的三年展，需要在现场有多少的时间他可以布，他可以布置？这是我目前的两个问题。谢谢。Thank you for your question and attention as well to the presentation. So I think the gallery is always putting the artist's concerns first, which is great. And as far as possible, there's usually, we usually, because it's a three year time period, try and have the art, we know the artist hopefully with two years planning time. So that gives the curators a lot of time to work with the artists to think about how best to present their work, find out what they would like, see how we can achieve that for the artist. Sometimes not everything can be achieved, but we try our hardest. And the curator and the artist are the people together in dialogue around that. And the curator represents the artist inside the institution too, so that they can really push for what the artist wants if there's any issues. So I think that we try, artists are generally very happy with the way their work is presented, often because um, they're very ambitious, so they're trying something new and we can hopefully help them to achieve that with the presentation of their, their work. And in APT9, I think maybe there was only one or two artists where we really couldn't achieve perhaps a scale that an artist wanted or something because it just wasn't uh, financially possible. Uh, so I hope that helps a little bit, but we do have a very good exhibition department and they work very closely with us and with the artists to um, try and source everything the artists need. So they will really work really hard to find particular materials or equipment or have things built in the gallery for the artists, which is fantastic. Um, in terms of funding, yes, it's very difficult. And we have to raise all the money for the triennial today. In the past, maybe they had some money from government, but now 
our, the gallery's budget doesn't provide any money for the exhibitions. So we have to go and raise a lot of money and um, this makes it increasingly difficult to bring, to have enough money to bring the artists. But our objective still is to bring as many artists as possible to install their work and to be at the opening so they can meet the other artists and be involved in the triennial as a collaboration. So we have to spend a lot of time writing grants and seeking sponsors and meeting people who might help us with the funding. And I think if the, continue, if the situation in Australia continues, probably the triennial will have to shrink because we can't afford to keep going on that area, on that tra trajectory with, you know, 80 artists. It's just not financially possible. So to work in that way, because we still want to bring the artists, we still want the artists to have a dialogue with our public. We want the artists to come and do residencies or workshops if that's what they'd like to do and really have a lot of contact time in Brisbane. So I think as funding decreases, we may have to make the project smaller. You will know, in, we'll know by next year. Um, and in terms of preparation, I think I said we have, we're already now working on the 10th triennial. So number nine just finished. Already I've written a plan for number 10. So already we, we really want to be doing our research now so that by early in 2020, we know the artists and we can start working with them to again, provide the best outcome for their work. Um, the director just asked me about the budget for APT, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not being silly here, but truly I can't remember the total figure because it's, it's still really um, being um, uh, evaluated. But certainly, you know, it's a, a, in Australian dollars, a $3 million project plus.那個阿邊老師問題有被回覆到嗎哈有有有謝謝謝謝那我們是不是在開放一到兩個問題哈因為時間的關係我們還有下一場所以我們開放一到兩個問題那剛好我們看到兩個手的那就你這兩個問題
Okay, so it's really about that particular work that is using the vernacular language instead of, I think you are trying to answer how the language you use to make audience, general audience to understand the artwork. So it's not her question. Her question is not about the communication between the artist and the general public. Rather, her question is about uh, how that particular artist, how she used her mother tongue or native language in her artwork. And many artists, of course, do use their own language in their artwork, which is, we, we, don't, we don't mediate that language in any way, so that language is presented and then often um, there is no mediation for that, so it's for the audience to engage with that language themselves and then to be able to find a way to interpret that through their own means or maybe through additional public programs or if there was something that was very difficult we might put a translation on the website but in terms of content in artworks apart from uh, moving image works which of course can be subtitled so that makes that much easier for a durational work but apart from that we don't do any other translation the artist's work is presented as it's made. Does that answer your question? Okay,然后,他解释解释的还蛮清楚 刚才我们看过很多艺人的那个三言展的具体作品，他也很多样化。然后我看到他的论述里面有几个关键字，是说他比较不想用标签化，而解释界限。然后非国家分类，也做出了分类。那也最后呢，提到了他是想不要用歧
if the work had been made earlier, for example, there were some artists, two artists who had already passed away, such as Roberto Chabet from the Philippines and Hussein Sharif from UAE, that their work was included because it was important to contemporary artists at that time of curating the APT. So that's really the only guideline that I can give, give you. And I think it, for the next APT, what happens is that the curators go and do a lot of research again, they talk to many peers, professionals, colleagues, and other artists in the region. And then we come back together and then we start a conversation about, okay, how should we focus this next APT? So it's a little too early to talk about number 10, but hopefully that gave you an idea about number nine. Thank you. Thank you。那我们很谢谢这位先生的问题啊，跟三很很深刻哈。那其实也是等于提醒我们，明年我们自己要做这个艺术季哈。我想可能不是去寻找盼着，而是去打破现有的一些盼着。如果讲到更新的